Carter comes from the Institute for the Improvement of the Human Condition, which he founded. At that organization, he worked with state and local safety net agencies to meet the emergency needs of socially and economically vulnerable citizens. Carter served as the director of the Arizona Department of Economic Security in addition to other state, federal, and local human services management positions. During his service in the Bush administration, he managed a supplemental nutrition assistance program, which we know as SNAP, and served as director of Office of Community Services. As commissioner of the Virginia Department of Social Services, his program was instrumental in growing in the capacity of its citizens. In his first five years, more than 25,000 public assistance recipients obtained gainful employment. That's awesome. Earning in excess of $200 million. during his tenure, Virginia's public assistance roles were reduced by more than half from the all-time high of 74,000 families to a 30-year low of 31,000 families. Uh, we need to understand that is a significant decrease, and Clarence has done some great work. On the local level, while serving as a director of Washington, uh, uh, director of the Washington, D.C. Department of Human Services, Carter led the design and operation of an initiative to house more than 1,000 homeless residents. It was this support that transformed the D.C. shelter-based homeless system to one, of the base, to one based in permanent supportive housing as the primary mechanism to reduce homelessness. So I want to just thank Clarence for coming. He's a person that cares deeply about our communities. And thank you, Clarence. So I can move a little bit, huh? Move a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Don't be wired to this. Okay. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here with you this morning. Okay. You know, but, but, but before I, I, I begin, um, I, I need to share with you that um, I have an understanding and an appreciation for the separation of church and state in the administration of our society. But what I don't understand is how anybody could believe that it's possible to separate human well-being from spirituality. It is simply not possible. But in the approach that we have taken in this society since the great society, we have somehow believed that government was going to be able to in and of itself solve the problems of the economically, socially, and developmentally vulnerable. And that, as I think the results will prove, is absolute folly. <clears throat> and so um, oftentimes when somebody from the government is in front of you, they will say, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> what I will say to you today is I am here from the government and I am asking for your help. Right. Um, as Reverend McCoy shared with you in my bio, I am the director of the Office of Family Assistance in the Department of Health and Human Services, and, and also currently serving as the acting director of the Office of Community Services. The Office of Family Assistance administers the principal welfare program for the country, the TANF program. In, in the vetting process for that position and having a conversation with the former HHS secretary, Dr. Tom Price, um, I, I said to him that um, it would not be my intention to simply administer a welfare program. And I said, because in all candor, the system of public supports is broken. 
And we are not going to move the needle by simply administering a program. I said that this system demands transformation. And he said, I, I understand that. Does he need to say a little bit more about it? So here's the little bit more. We have, in the federal government alone, it is either 86, 109, or 129 federally authorized programs that were designed specifically to address the issues of the socially, economically, and developmentally vulnerable in our society. Now, it's problematic when you can't even get the number right. Okay? But the problems begin with all of those individual programs that have no overarching objective. Each program was designed to address a singular aspect of the human condition, whether that aspect be nutrition through a, through a food stamps program, or housing through HUD support, or, or cash assistance through TANF, or on and on and on. Each program was meant to address one aspect of the human condition. The rules were set for that program, the funding was set for those programs. But the problem is, the people that we serve don't come to you in one dimension. They don't come to you with that one challenge. They come to you with a range of challenges in which we need to be able to take a comprehensive approach to solving those problems. The second part of this is that, when I said we have no overarching objective, what we focus on in the system of public supports is delivering the benefit, good, or service. And we somehow believe we've solved the problem if we've gotten you the benefit. But here's the challenge. If you still need that benefit next month, we haven't solved the problem. And so our argument is what we have to have in the system of public supports is a true north which is dedicated to growing the capacity of the socially and economically vulnerable to reduce their dependency on public supports. The, the system of public supports should be a mile marker in a life's journey, not a destination unto itself. We currently would have judge our compassion and our efforts in this regard by how much money we dedicate to all of these programs. Our argument is that we measure the wrong thing. That what we ought to be measuring is strengthening the capacity of the people who most desperately need this. The bedrock principle of this society is freedom. Freedom is not dependency. And so we have to turn around this system of support to not make it be focused on the delivery of benefits, goods, and services, not make it focused on did you get the housing voucher, okay? Did you get the TANF benefit? Okay? But make it focused on, did we help you not need that benefit? Did we help you be able to stand on your own two feet and craft your vision of the American dream? That is what we have been directed to transform the system of public supports in America to be. And when I say that I am here asking for your help, it is 
understanding that the arrogance of government believes that somehow it is the principal problem solver. But we have an understanding that if we are truly going to be able to solve the problems of vulnerability, we have to unleash every sector of our society in support of this work. Amen. Every sector and that and the community of faith is one of those sectors which has to be unleashed and empowered. Yeah. Yeah. And so as we move in the direction of this transformation, we are going to be calling out every aspect, both public and private, that functions and doesn't function. You, know, you, you will hear a hue and cry from some programs that the president's budget recommends not be funded. And you will hear some folks say, well, that's because they don't care. That's because those cold-hearted conservatives want people not to be able to make their way. But I'm going to tell you something. That couldn't be further from the truth, okay? The idea is every precious penny that our nation spends in this pursuit ought to add value to our objective to strengthen people, okay? And so, yes, this president is not afraid to call out a program that ain't working. Okay. So you're going to hear an awful lot of that hue and cry. But guys, let me tell you something. Star, Star shared a figure with you when she was presenting this morning. And she said that we spend, federal and state government, we spend 900 billion dollars a year in pursuit of these programs. I, I leaned over to Derek and I said, um, it's actually 972 billion, but who's counting? Okay. The truth is that is almost a trillion dollars every single year that we expend in this pursuit. Now there are some people going to tell you we don't spend enough. But here's what I will tell you. It is not that we don't spend enough. It is that what we spend, we spend stupidly. And so we have been directed to turn over every rock, to analyze every penny, to ensure that each dollar is expended in service to the economically, socially, and developmentally vulnerable. And folks, I will tell you in this transformative model, one of the places where I hope to engage the community of faith is in this issue of most of the people that need these kinds of supports to make their way, they don't only need transaction, they need relationship. Okay? I'm going to tell you something. Government ain't in the business of relationship. Okay? Government's in the business of transaction. Okay? But we will not help, we will not help our neighbors who are in need of these supports grow beyond this moment 
without being in relationship with them. I'm going to sh share a, a quick story um, about an organization that we do some work with. And, and, and then I'm going to um, shut up and take some, some questions and thoughts from you. So there was this organization in, um, in Arizona. I, I spent about eight, um, eight years in Arizona as director of the Department of Economic Security. And um, this church in North Phoenix, they um, each a couple of times a month, they would prepare sandwiches and go into a, a park, and they would have those sandwiches and orange juice for the homeless and the economically vulnerable. And they were very, very proud of what they were doing. This was their giving back to the community. And one of the individuals that um, was in the park one day went up and asked one of the parishioners, could I go to church with you sometime? And the guy recounts, I was stunned by that question and didn't know what to do with it. And so um, a couple of them got together and they said, sure. And out of that came the understanding that while what that congregation was doing in providing the sandwiches and the orange juice, while it was done from their heart, it was not truly serving the problem. Okay? And so I think in many ways, we in our society have misdefined what true compassion is. You know, somehow, somehow, we think we see somebody on a street corner with a sign asking for for spare change. And we stop and provide a, a dollar and we feel so good about ourselves. I'd have done something. And guys, the truth is, if that person is truly on that corner in need, that thing hadn't helped them solve their problem. You feel good about it, but it haven't helped them solve that problem. True compassion is helping someone grow beyond that moment of their vulnerability. That is how we need to transform this society. And so that is why I am here this morning from the government and asking for your help. Your help in transformation, your help in growing the capacity of the vulnerable in our society to live out their own version of the American dream. This is what this president has challenged us to do. And I am honored to be a part of that and privileged to partner with you in that endeavor. I very much appreciate the chance to share a few remarks with you. Would be happy uh, to take any questions, comments, thoughts, anything you want to yell about. Somebody bring a, is somebody, somebody bringing a mic around or? Good morning. Thank you so much. My name is Pat Hunter, Patricia Hunter from Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I truly appreciate what you just said. And, and, um, but you know, I've worked in my community and it's, I see so many times, you know, like you say, you, you know, people coming up to you, I'm homeless, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. And I, I used to work at um, Operation Blessing in my mm -hmm. local place. And, and I had a woman come up to me, you know, 
come in the center and say, well, I need money for my lights and this, that, and the other. And, and when we looked at all the things she had, you know, we had to e evaluate, you know, how much income she gets, da 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 She comes in and, and we said, no, we can't provide this because we did it last month or whatever. Right. And she says, well, you're gonna make, make sure our children gonna be in the, my children gonna be in the dark? I said, no, ma'am. It's your responsibility. Your responsibility. It's your responsibility That's right. that your children are going to be in the dark. That. Your 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 um baby daddies and everybody else. That's I right. just 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 plainly said it like that. Yep. You know, and I was like, I, I didn't mean to be cold or anything, but but we as the church sometimes you you're so right. We're thinking we're doing something to help people, but we need that mindset that you know. I, 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 I'm not going to get my food stamps. They, they're going to, you know. No, we need to teach them how to fish themselves. You know, and, and it's so many times it's not coming from their church or, or their pastors to preach. They need to get out of that church and get in a church that preaches the word. Absolutely. That teaches them how to get up on their feet and take it themselves. That's exactly right. Okay, bye. Oh. No, no that's question. It, that's that's all my comment. Well, well let, 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 me, let me respond. But, 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 but let me respond. Let, 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 let me respond. What, one of the, okay, what, what, one of the, 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 the aspects of cure that I so resonate with is this issue of personal responsibility. It is not anybody's responsibility to make your life work but you. That is not cruel, okay? That is not disconnected. That is life. And we don't help anybody when we somehow create the false notion that someone else will set you free. Because only you can do that. Now there certainly can be help creating enabling conditions but at the end of the day, every man, sh woman, and child has got to run their own race. And what our society has to do is prepare them to do so. Yes, ma'am. Uh, since you've been working at doing your job, um, has, have any changes been made yet, or are you still in the investigative pro pro uh, process? So w w we are still in the early stages one of the things that I, well, there's actually a couple of things. One is we have prepared new legislation around the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program where we're trying to focus more intently on how work, which is we require for, required for receipt of benefits, how we can truly engage people in work as a pathway to self-sufficiency, not just, not just counting whether or not somebody got a job, but then supporting them in that job to help them grow beyond that moment. Then the other thing that, I am, that, uh, we're, that we are focused on is looking around the country to find demonstrations at the community level that are focused on this idea of growing people beyond their vulnerability. What we understand is that there is pretty much a universal acceptance that what we are doing currently doesn't work. And so communities all around this country have begun to operating under that idea that what we're doing doesn't work. They are moving in this direction of organizing their resources to help those that they serve grow beyond that moment. So what we are doing is we are trying to identify those local initiatives and then support those initiatives because they are achieving, those initiatives are achieving the objectives. And, 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 and so one of the things that I would ask of you is where you understand some of those local initiatives. 
if you could bring them to our attention and we will connect and see how we can support those initiatives to, to, to be able to achieve this objective of growing capacity to reduce dependency. Uh, um, uh, Reverend McCoy is going to be able to, uh, I've got some cards here on me, but Reverend McCoy's got our contact information. We'll be able to make that happen. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. yep. It's not really a question. I'm Richard Cherry Martin from Philadelphia. And um, you've actually answered my question in terms of identifying local initiatives that are working and trying to connect you know, congregations and for that matter, community organizations. But I also wanted to affirm what you said earlier. Uh, our church is almost 300 years old. It was closed down in the 60s. And I've been there for almost 30 years. And we had a similar experience. We were, were doing a lot of feeding in Center City. And one guy asked me one time, can I come down to your church? And I didn't know what he was talking about. But he challenged me and walked all the way from Center City, Philadelphia to Mount Airy which is almost about 8 to 10. I didn't think he was going to come, but he showed up. And then after church, he said he wanted to go to a drug rehab. Right. And I didn't even know what he was talking about. Anyway, to the glory of God, I drove him to where he said he wanted to go. I went back within two weeks. He was completely different. I put on weight, was doing great. And I learned one principle, that we don't have to create all these programs. We have to find programs that already exist and be like a resource center and a referral center. Absolutely. So I had the chance of just sharing with Dr. McCoy that one of the great things that Kill can do, Kill is an advocacy group. We are service providers. So Kill should help us as service providers to be able to form these partnerships. Great. So I would appreciate that you work hard on helping us to know those agencies. Absolutely. Don't let the city tell us. Don't let the state tell us because a lot of time they will still keep pushing their favorites. That's right. But if we know from the top, you That's know, right. those initiatives that you are funding that are doing well in our cities, then we can partner with them. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hello, David May in Frontline Youth Communications. I love the fact that you said you cannot separate uh, humanity from spirituality. You cannot. And I think, um, but at the grassroots level, all across the country, I work with a lot of TANF-funded programs. And the pressure for, or really a pressure against faith-based community organizations to, uh, you know, get TANF funds and things like that, Man, they're always on them for proselytizing, or even if they're not, just because they are a faith-based program, right. that constant pressure. And so what are, what are the services that can be made available to them in terms of either training, here's how, here are, here are the boundaries to which you can you know, share your faith or whatever. But it's, it's tough when, when you have a faith-based organization, a church, and their mission is obviously Christ, and, you know, and then they got government funds. Sometimes that's hard for them right. to to navigate? What, what resources are available? Okay, so, so um, I, I was also um, a part of the, the, the Bush administration in which there was a very considerable effort to engage the community of faith. And so there was a series of regional conferences where what happened was, was the administration was introducing all of these different federal opportunities to the audience for the purpose of explaining that the community of faith can be a part of this. What I feel like that initiative lacked was some context. And what I mean by some context is, okay, instead of just saying, here it is, it's available, there has to be some of that technical assistance, which then helps the community of faith shape what it is choosing to do to then be able to access those opportunities. Okay. 
And so what I hope to be able to do in this transformative model is we will work with the broader community of faith on being a part of this problem solving, that we will build in those training and technical assistance mechanisms that will say not only here is a resource, but then here is help in how, in how best to access those resources. I think we have to connect those dots in a way that we have not previously. My question is this. If you were to identify a working program right. that's not transactional, because mm -hmm. transactions never change people. That's right. If you found a program that was transactional, that was established with a clear record that involved the church, when you say we're here to ask for help, what does that help look like? Let me give you an example. There is a network across the nation that involves 137 counties. Uh, I believe the number is about 4,000 churches. In this particular network, two, one of the counties is up in Nampa, Idaho. 349 individuals was in a program. 35% of those were on welfare. At the end of the program, which was a year, of the 35%, only 81 were still on welfare out of 349 families. They paid off a total of $4,186,702.36 in debt. Paid off. Mm -hmm. These were individuals who weren't just the recipients of dollars, but the program actually changed them. That's right. This thing is in 137 counties across the United States, have been in operation for about 20 years. My question, this is a program that actually works. They've been able to document that, and I can show mm -hmm. you the documentation. What does that partnership then with the government look like if you've got a program that's really working? And this, by the way, is engaging. This is the partnership of churches. Right. These aren't social agencies. These are churches. They have employed what they are calling redemptive compassion, mm -hmm. which really looks at that. What does that begin to look like? in terms of some kind of interface or interaction with the government that doesn't do like the brother here was concerned about. Okay. So, so here for me is what would be important in developing a partnership like that, okay? One thing that is very important to us as we try to engage all sectors of our society is not only do we not want the consumer of these services to be wards of the government, but we don't want the service providers to be wards of the government either. And, and so in this partnership, what we would aggressively work to do is to see how we can connect that partnership to other sources of capital that, again, are bringing free market principles to this, and again, not focusing on just being another government service provider, Man. okay? So, 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 and when I say every sector has got to be unleashed, one of the, to me, one of the biggest disservices that we have done to this work in, in our government-centric model is we have crowded out the free enterprise system, okay? The engine that has created the strongest economy ever known to humankind, we freeze it out of this work. How foolish can we be? So, so, so I would want in this partnership for us to say, okay, we have something here that works. We have relationship here that has the kind of capacity that reduces public dependency 
okay, enhances individual freedom. How do we help that thing grow and prosper and, and, and grow and prosper by the work that it does, not simply because it's a award to the government? Man, I love that. Man. Man.